So good morning, everyone. If you're new here, I'm Reverend Charles Perry, and I'm the senior minister here at Unity of Birmingham. And before I get into today's message, at least what I had planned on giving for a message, I wanted to talk a little bit about something that came to me in meditation earlier this week. And that is, you know, in unity sometimes I think people don't really know what to think about us. And if you're coming from a traditional Christian perspective, you may never really be sure. It's like, well, when people ask me, am I saved, what do I tell them? And what do I say about Jesus? And, and where does our faith come from? What do we think about the Bible? And how do all these things that we talk about in unity fit into that? How does, what, what's that all supposed to mean? And see, I take, in some ways, I take for granted that people understand when they come through these doors that there was never anything that we did that required us to be saved, you know. I take a look at Finley and at Wyatt, and I wonder how people could think a child could have come into the world with original sin. You know, how, how they could think that there's something wrong with that baby that, you know, needs to be fixed. And I go back to the same puzzlement that I had as a child, wondering what sort of God would demand the murder of his own son to somehow make me okay you know, to make that baby okay, what, 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 what does that mean? So in unity, we take a look at all these things and we look at them allegorically, we look at them metaphorically, we look at them metaphysically. And when I talk about being saved, what I mean is that today, because I follow the principles and teachings of an itinerant rabbi named Yeshua, who we are pretty sure lived in Nazareth about 2,000 years ago. I'm saved from believing in the false illusion that I'm somehow separate from God. You see, he taught all of us that we and God are one. He referred to God in a word that made sense to him. He used the word Abba which was Aramaic for daddy. Now, they lived in a paternalistic society, so the God they came up with was male. There are many societies that were maternalistic, and they have female deities. But in unity, we think of God as being all things. There is nothing God is not, and that includes us. And... It's not a person or a demigod that saves us. It's our own knowing of that principle that God is in all things, including us, including those precious babies. And that's what we are. We are precious babies of the universe. And we always have been. And so really what we do here is we remind ourselves we remind ourselves of the way the universe works. We remind ourselves of the way the universe loves us. The way that the universe is for us and not against us. The way that the universe is living in, through, and as us and is not some spiteful judge off somewhere sitting on a throne, waiting for the moment of our death to decide if we will be in paradise or in damnation for eternity. That's not the deal, and it never has been. Now, there are some people for whom that is the deal. And as I like to say sometimes, it's not up to me to take somebody's Jesus away from them. It's not up to me to take somebody's 
God away from them. If someone needs an angry, judgmental God, I'm going to honor their process. But when they show up here, I'm going to tell them what I perceive to be the truth. And I'm going to do my very best to make sure that they walk out of here with some tools and some principles to live by that will allow them to live in the kingdom of heaven right here and right now. That's what we teach. That's what we do. When we talk about New Thought Christianity, that's what we're talking about. So as we look into these principles and as we look at this journey that we have being human, being spiritual beings but living in this dimension, living in these bodies, living with one another, walking through this together. There's so many things that we are called to deal with, so many experiences that we have to process, to overcome, to learn from, to grow from, and to be a little more and more of the Christ, that anointed divine being that we truly are every day, a little more every day. These past few weeks, we've been talking about how we can use the process of transition, which happens to, so it happens to all of us. Many of us are right in the middle of some very challenging transitions. So many people in this congregation. This ministry is a ministry in transition. I am in transition. So as we study transition, we've been looking at finding yourself in transition by Reverend Robert Brummett. And this is, this is the book. And um, today I would just like to ask each and every one of us to add Robert, the author of this book, to our prayers. He recently went through his third surgery. Um, we are holding that he will be recovered enough to join us on September 27th when we kick off our Fall Faith series on another one of his books. Um, that may not happen, but uh, we're going to see Robert healthy and whole and healed. He is a light in this movement. Among the teachings in this book are that transition takes place in certain stages. And if we can identify those stages and do the things that we're called to do each step along the way, we have a better chance of not only walking through those transitions gracefully, but in using them for our spiritual upliftment and unfoldment. And Robert identifies three stages that transitions have. They are endings, the void, and new beginnings. Two weeks ago, we talked about the endings and how every transition actually begins with an ending. And as I pointed out, we're probably pretty familiar with the fact that in our society, Endings are something we try not to look at or think about too much. Endings feel like failures sometimes. We don't like failures. In a society that has become very industrialized and mechanistic, an ending sort of feels like, well, the machine broke. And we don't like to be broken. So one of the things that we are really apt to do is to immediately try to go on to our new beginning, to immediately fix whatever was broken and just get on with it. But that's not the way it works. When I began 12-step back in Florida, I had a sponsor. Um, I've talked about Jay once or twice. And... Um, Jay used to say all sorts of things to me, some of which I've shared with you. But one of them was that he'd say, Charles, you know, when a door closes, another one opens. But they never tell you about all that time in the hall. 
That time in the hall is what Robert calls the void. And it is a time that we are most uncomfortable with, particularly in the West. As Robert says, if, if we think of endings, if we could think of an ending as something like, you know, an earthquake and uh, a mountain, you know, maybe a volcano erupting and, and it being violent and destructive, the void is like an empty day in the desert or a day, a quiet day out on the ocean, flat, empty quiet. I am struck by how we as humans are becoming more and more addicted to input. You know, we see people wandering around. I would say there's probably at least one person in this congregation right now who has their cell phone in their hand. Not going to ask you to stick your hand in the air. Taking notes? Okay, all right, all right, yeah, okay. Just taking notes. I, I have what wasn't, wasn't talking about you. But, uh, yeah, yeah, but, but. <laughs> but, but, you know, for, for a lot of people, they're not using it to take notes, you know, because we've become addicted to information. You know, we keep thinking that we need to put the next thing in to hear. As, as Robert pointed out, we come to think of enlightenment as an additive process. Um, he also mentions Lao Tzu's quote. Lao Tzu wrote the Tao Te Ching, and he said that um, in learning, knowledge is added, but to achieve Tao, something is taken away. Every day, something is taken away. I remember Yoda telling Luke, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that is exactly what we are called to do in the void. And it's, it's interesting, that, that part of the Star Wars mythos where Luke encounters Yoda, he'd had his family brutally murdered, you know, that was certainly an ending. And he went not to a desert, but to a, uh, a swamp planet to unlearn what he had learned, to become empty so that he could learn something new, not about how to fight with a lightsaber, but about who he was. And so it is with us. It's not so much about getting the next thing, about finding the next cat picture on Facebook, about reading the next email, seeing the next news, reading the next political poll. It's about emptying ourselves of the importance we have attached to such ephemeral things so that we can replace that attachment with the sure and certain knowledge that God is with us in every moment, providing for our every need, giving us direction, guiding us along the way. When we are empty enough, when we are at peace enough to allow that to happen, In the first chapter, rather at the end, um, one of the questions that, uh, one of the points that Robert makes is that one of the deepest human needs is the need for meaning. We use meaning as a roadmap of reality. How many of you have been in the deep desert before? Some of you have. If you've ever experienced the deep desert, um, you'll know that roads are temporary things because the desert will swallow them. But um, you look from horizon to horizon and 
direction seems to make no difference. I remember when I was deployed to the desert, sometimes during some of the sandstorms, the entire sky would turn orange. You couldn't even see where the sun was, what direction it was coming from. Direction had no meaning. Can you imagine what it was like for the Israelites in the story of the Exodus? They're standing on the other side of the Red Sea. The Egyptians have just been drowned. They're all having a big party. Yay, the Egyptians are done. And then they turn. And there's no road. They have no road maps, no GPS, no AAA. And it's like, um, Moses? Where do we go now? When we read that story, you know, it doesn't matter if any of it ever happened factually. It is a brilliant, brilliant roadmap for us on how to guide us through the transitions in our own lives. As the story begins, of course, the first day they're really happy with Moses. You know, we just beat the Egyptians. You know, we're one and oh. We head off into the desert. Within three days, they're already complaining. They have nothing to drink. So Moses cries out to God. God finds him some water. Actually, it's bitter water until Moses finds a tree and throws it in the water, makes the water sweet. This happens over and over again throughout their trip. They have a need. They call out to God. God fulfills it, makes a promise, makes a covenant with them. You know, I'll take care of you. You will be my people. Now, sometimes that promise was an unconditional promise. Sometimes there was a condition attached. The one condition that was always attached to the promise of God leading people through the desert was that they obey the Lord. Now, I know a bunch of you probably just jump back about half an inch. Obeying the Lord sounds kind of scary. Or at least a little oppressive. But let's take a look at this from kind of a unity point of view. I define God as the universe, everything in it, all that lies behind it, and the laws by which it operates. So if I define the Lord that way, what does obeying feel like? What does that become? Well, to me, what that means is I'm not trying to buck the system. There are certain principles that work in this universe, principles that work in God. When I am in alignment with those principles, things work. When I try to make things happen that are not in alignment with those principles, it doesn't work. It's pretty simple. And we talk about some of these principles, the law of giving and receiving, the law of mind action. There are a lot of other easier to see principles at work in the universe, like the law of gravity. But they all work similarly. They're all part of the box that we're in. And any time we try to say, you know what, I've got a better idea, we are apt to get lost in the desert. We're apt not to get what we need. Many years later, thousands maybe, Jesus said, ask and it will be given. It's interesting to note that the path through the desert was not lined with water fountains and McDonald's, right? The people had to ask. When they did, they received. When they said, we need water, water was there. When they said, we need food, food was there. 
interesting thing. And again, another principle. There wasn't enough of the manna, the substance that served as food, for them to hoard, to save up. There was enough for each day. Except the day before the Sabbath, when they would get twice as much as they needed so that they did not have to work on the Sabbath. Our needs are met. Maybe not all the desires of our egos. But our needs are met when we ask, when we call out. They found direction by following God. They didn't have a road through the desert. They had to trust. They had to use their faith. They were led by a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night. Sometimes, just stayed in the same place. They would pitch their tents, do their thing, collect their manna, and then it would move on. And it is so like that for us as we move through these voids in our lives. Sometimes we are tempted to just rush off in the direction that seems to be the best direction to go in. You know? Some of us who may be in a, an employment transition, you know, there's probably a temptation to just taking anything, you know, or maybe even going back to something that you left before, something that was not fulfilling, something that was crushing your soul rather than waiting on the Lord, waiting in the wilderness for that pillar of fire to move for you. Same thing happens with relationships. Who? You know, I'm walking through that right now. When a relationship ends, it's very tempting to find something to fill that void. I have a dog now, <laughs> which is awesome. Murphy will be joining us on Sundays sometime soon. She's actually already uh, joined us for Wednesday night class and assisted with her first counseling session and did a really wonderful job. Um, for those of you that don't follow what I'm doing on Facebook, I uh, adopted a career change dog from Southeastern Guide Dogs and I'm going to be taking her through therapy dog training. So she's kind of in the desert right now, actually. She's in a crate, as you know. But, but yes, we, um, and I can tell you from times before when I went through relationship transition that uh, there were times when I headed out in the wrong direction, trying to make something happen because I just didn't feel like waiting. But the truth is, we're really not ready until we're ready. And that's what the 40 years in the desert's all about. It wasn't necessarily 40 years. We're done when we're done. We're ready for that next career when we're ready for that next career. We're ready for that next relationship when we're ready for that next relationship. We're ready for the next home when we're ready. Maybe not when our ego wants it, but when we're ready. So one of the big things that we have to learn to do is to take care of ourselves in the desert, in the wilderness in that time between times in the hallway. And it's funny, the ways that Robert lists in finding yourself in transition to take care of yourself are really great ways of taking care of yourself no matter what. Now, a couple of these are kind of specific to this he says the quickest way through the void is to embrace each experience fully and then let it go. 
And that is a real key. So often, many of us refuse to let go even when it's time. Now, I want to say if it is still time for grief, it's still time for grief, and that's okay. And grief for each one of us is a season that has its own clock. You know, some of us need to grieve a little longer. Some of us need to do it and move on. Whatever we need, it's okay. But what we don't want to do is make our grief our new identity. We don't want to make that who we are. We don't want to hang on to that or any of the stages of it. We don't want to make our anger who we are. We don't want to make our depression who we are. But we can honor each of those stages, embrace them fully, walk through them. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't camp out in it. Right? Now, this is one that um, those of us in 12 step may have heard our first year in the program. If possible, avoid making any major decisions or long term commitments during this period. That's good advice. Now, obviously, at some point, we have to start making those commitments and those decisions. But when we are in this period, you know, whatever point it is, any extra things that come along, if possible, it's good to put those off until our minds are clear and we know our new direction. Don't try to push the river. And I know that many of us have done that. We want to just make it happen faster and get on with it. Instead of allowing spirit to unfold the universe the way that it will. And again, that goes back to living in the universe by the laws of the universe. Not trying to force it to bend to our will. Things that we would rather not happen, happen when we do that. Pray and meditate regularly. Trust in God. Take care of yourself physically. All those are things that are part of daily spiritual discipline and practice that are good for us. Keeping a daily journal is another thing that we can do as part of our daily practice. So is developing a support system. Something we're going to be doing here at Unity of Birmingham in the near future is developing a system of small groups to help all of us have that support, that loving community that each and every one of us needs. paying attention to your dreams. This is certainly something that is important in the void because what often happens is that as our conscious mind begins to clear out, that which has been residing in our subconscious comes forward. And it may come to us when we're in meditation. It may come to us when we're dreaming. It may simply appear as a thought that seems to spring from nowhere. But we need to pay attention to what our subconscious tells us. We also need to make sure that we have fully assimilated the lesson from whatever came before. Now, in the story of the Israelites going through the desert, what happens is that God calls Moses up to the mountain to give him the commandments. Well, while Moses is away, people start wondering, gee, where's our spiritual leadership? Where'd he go? He may not come back. I need something. And they take all their gold and melt it down, and they make a golden calf. And probably everybody knows that part of the story. 
What many of you may not know is what happened next. Moses came back and he was upset with them. Well, he broke the tablets he got from God, and we probably all remember that from the Ten Commandments, right? Okay. But then he melted the calf down, ground it into powder, and made them drink it. So it is with us. You know, the process that we go through in the 12 steps is along the way we make a list of all of our resentments and all of our angers and all those issues that we've had. We tell someone about all of our issues and angers and shortcomings. We ask God to remove them from us and then we go and make amends to all these people. We completely process all those false idols, all those things that we've done. We completely assimilate that until it's gone. I sometimes wish everyone could go through that process. I wish everyone were desperate enough to do the very humbling things that are required because it really does give us a clean slate to move off in a new direction. It really is drinking the ground up gold from the past. Once the people had done that, Moses went back up the mountain and got some replacement tablets. And then he got a whole bunch more instructions which basically fill the next couple of books in the Bible. But they were ready to move on and at that point they had stopped simply being people wandering in the desert and they had become a nation, a nation with a purpose, a nation with a covenant with God. What's interesting is that at the end of their journey, they come to the promised land and they send out some scouts. Well, most of those scouts came back and reported that it was a scary place and that the people were giants and you know, they, maybe it was a mistake that they'd gone there. Two guys, Joshua and Caleb, came back and said, the place flows with milk and honey. It's awesome. Now, it is occupied, but it's a great place. In biblical stories, very often, individual people represent thoughts. So in the consciousness of the Israelites, and the nation of Israel generally represents our entire consciousness, all those people who saw the giants and you know, saw it as a, a place that was scary, they represent that part of us that wants to hold us back into the past. So does anyone remember what happened next? They had to keep wandering in the desert till all those people died. Yeah. The only person from the original generation that came out into the desert who was allowed into the promised land was Joshua because he saw, he saw what it was there. He knew that it was a land flowing with milk and honey. So what we have to do is we have to spend enough time in the desert until all those thoughts that are telling us, no, you can't go forward. It's scary there. You'll get hurt until those thoughts die away. When we're ready, our inner Joshua, that, that guide, that scout that can see the good in our future, will continue to live in us and will take us into our own promised land but not until we've spent that time in the void. Not until we've rested in the quiet and allowed all that is old to pass away. Please join me in prayer. Sweet Spirit, Father, Mother, God, 
so many of us today stand upon the desert, our own personal wilderness. We turn within to find you. We lay down that which is old. We allow those thoughts which no longer support us to fall away. We look not to the world for guidance, but to you. And still a small voice and fire in the night. As that stillness grows, as our emptiness expands, we see more and more clearly. We hear and we know God, we thank you for your direction. We thank you for all the sustenance that we find, even in our emptiest hours. We know that truly you are all we need for that knowledge, for one another, and for that salvation that we find in living by the principles that our brother taught. We say thank you. Thank you, God.